and then we had Chase today that one of our interns, Danielle Corelli, um, had in the MICU a couple weeks ago. So Danielle is joining us from the VA clinic. So a huge thank you to her for helping out. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and defer to Danielle for the HPI and everything else. Take away, Danielle. All right. Hi, guys. Um, so this guy is a 27 year old man, unknown past medical history. Um, he was found down in the Driftwood Motel in Denver earlier in the morning, uh, surrounded by IV syringes. Um, he was given Narcan by EMS, didn't really change his mental status, um, but he did eventually become more alert and awake um, and became pretty agitated by the time he got to the emergency department. Um, once he got there, he was not able to follow commands, um, extremely agitated, and the ED elected to intubate him pretty early on, um, I think just for his safety and safety of everyone else and um, just to protect the airway. Um, he also had poor IV access, so they had to place an IO when he got there. Great. So really interesting first piece of information. So for our residents, interns, and students in the room, um, the majority of this case is going to be management. It's a great case. But for the interns in the room, any additional questions for either our ED colleagues, if you were getting this call like Danielle did, or for um, Danielle to kind of fill in some gaps? I'm not sure exactly um, the time course for that. I know they didn't give him a bunch of meds to sedate him first and then intubate him. Um, it was a little unclear when we got called to come down, but by the time we saw him, he was already intubated. And then what are, what are people's knowledge? Does anyone in the room know the Jerkwood Motel? Yeah. Does anyone does anyone have one of the questions I have when I first heard the story um, and then you presenting it was sort of what was the what happened in the Driftwood Motel? Like what else did we know about what went on inside that room? Um, did not know much, but we eventually did get some additional history from one of his friends that showed up. Um, so he said that uh, the patient actually just moved here from Florida about three weeks prior, um, has a history of drug abuse, um, I guess was not feeling well that whole previous day before, um, was just feeling really weak, fatigued, nauseous, um, and then eventually ended up going to the motel by himself. Um, not sure what happened there, but he stopped answering his friend's texts. They got worried about him the next day, and then that's when the staff went in there and found him down. Were there any pill bottles in the room or just syringes? No pill bottles, just syringes. Friend told us that he has a history of um, doing cocaine, marijuana, and then injecting heroin. Do we think it's yeah, so uh, we'll clarify So we think he was down, right, Danielle, for about 24 hours, perhaps longer? Yeah, around that time. Great. Yeah, pretty unclear the timeline though. All right. Um, so moving right along to our vitals and exam in the ER. So Danielle, what were the vitals when you, when you guys initially got called? Um, when we got called, his temperature was 31 degrees Celsius. Um, heart rate was 93. Blood pressure was 92 over 54. Um, and he was intubated at that point, was satting well, but was on, I think, 80% FiO2. Great. And any uh, notable findings on your initial physical exam? Yeah, um, initial physical exam, he was intubated and pretty heavily sedated, so it wasn't arousal at all to um, verbal or physical stimuli. Um, he had the ET tube in place. Um, he had a C collar around his neck. Um, I think they just placed that because they saw a hematoma on the back of his head, <laughs> unable to clear his C spine. Um, 
he, let's see, he did have dried blood around his nares as well. Um, the emergency department reported that they had suctioned out about 750 cc's of just bilious dark fluid from his stomach. Um, and then heart and lungs actually sounded okay. Um, his lungs were a little difficult to assess because we could only listen on the front, but um, didn't hear any wheezes or crackles and those vented breath sounds. Um, abdomen was soft, non-descended. Um, and then his extremities were um, warm and well profuse when I saw him in the emergency department note. Um, they also noted on their initial eval that he had ecchymosis on the tailbone and erythema pressure wound to the right buttock. Great. So stopping right there for a second. So what are the what do our kind of residents in the room think about that extremity exam? So what is the what is the ecchymosis in the tailbone and the pressure wound on the right buttock? Tell us. I had that young with the pressure wound seems bizarre. So that he must have been down for a certain amount of time. So well of that. Yeah, I just doubt the whole story that we got. Perfect. Yeah, so Dan, one of our third year residents, and Sam, one of our second year med residents, perfectly saying like they kind of doubt the story and the guy that young should not have a pressure wound. Uh, so was he really just down for 24 hours or was it perhaps longer? But either way, a really, really helpful physical exam, especially the extremities. And then another thing uh, that's really helpful, kind of a notable absent finding here, is a tense or kind of tender or erythematous uh, air extremity. So anytime someone's been bound down, you want to make sure that they don't have some sort of occult compartment syndrome. And so doing a very, very thorough exam of every single compartment and their upper extremities and lower extremities is super important and then making sure you document that it's negative. All right. So while Danielle is in the process of getting this call from the ER and writing her note, the, uh, we'll say the nurse in the NICU comes up to show you uh, this EKG. So if I could have one of our upper level residents in the room give us their focused read of this EKG, that would be fantastic. So YQRS looks like a left bundle pattern, does look like a regular uh, rhythm. It's a little on the tachycardic side to normal and got like Definitely ST and T wave abnormalities. I see um, some T wave inversions in multiple leads, um, at least the inferior and lateral leads. And then I also see possibly like I mean, hypothermic, we might be looking at some new waves there. <clears throat> so, Davon uh, just did an excellent read. So, Davon, did you say that there was a right bundle pattern? Oh, I said uh, left. Left bundle. Okay, so Davon says there's a left bundle pattern. So there's some sort of like interventricular conduction delay. I think Davon saw the bunny years in V6, the lateral leads, and that's why he was thinking left bundle. So he's sort of right on the point. And then Davon also brings up a really good kind of clinical clue that we know this guy is hypothermic. So what else are we looking at here? Is there a specific name for that finding? Perfect. So the room is kind of under their breath, everyone together said <laughs> uh, So Davon had a great read, the room did nicely. So the circles here show various forms of the Osborne wave or the J wave. And so the J point is the point between the QRS and the ST segment, and the J wave is a wave between the QRS and the ST segment. And so what you're looking at here is you're looking at a negative J wave in ABR and V1, and then a positive J wave or Osborne wave, and essentially all the other leads. And so like uh, Logan and the rest of the room brought up, the number one thing on that differential is hypothermia. But does anyone else know other things on that differential, things that you might get quizzed about on rounds? Hypercalcemia? So hypercalcemia is on there. There's two others. So early repoll, which I think if you are ever in doubt on rounds, just say early repolarization. Uh, I think that's always right in cardiology. But hypercalcemia is on there, and then the Brugada syndrome as well. And so like Danielle told us, so this patient was 31 degrees Celsius at 10.37 in the morning when he came in and had prominent J waves or Osborne waves. So a brief historical tangent, where on earth did this come from? So there's a, an intensivist named John J. Osborne. 
the J, his middle name, is absolutely no indication of the J word. Um, but in 1953, he wrote this paper when he was pretty young, where he took a bunch of dogs and essentially froze the dog, and then saw when the dog went into beat it. And he noted that this current of injury, what he called it, uh, occurred right before the dog went into beat it, and they were cold. And so he hypothesized that there was something in the heart which was causing a conduction abnormality to predispose to arrhythmia. So he called it a current of injury. And then this, much, much later, is from 2003, and this is a New England Journal of Medicine image, and it's essentially just showing the giant Osborne waves again in hypothermia, but notably what I highlighted here, the author of this image is Maury Krantz from Denver Health Medical Center. So Maury Krantz is one of the, our esteemed cardiologists at Denver Health, and there is almost a 100% chance that if you rotate with him for longer than a week, he will quiz you about what an Osborne wave is. So everyone in the room, just be prepared. Uh, he asked you that because he wrote this image in internal medicine article. And methadone prolongs the QT. And methadone. So as Dan points out, Rory Kranz's other claim to fame is that methadone prolongs the QT interval. So now that you guys know both those things, be ready. All right. So, um, we get a repeat EKG that Danielle orders around 12.54, and so now he's 33.2. And if you look on here, you can see that the J wave or the Osborne wave is already substantially better in almost all of these. And then just to document and prove that this actually goes away as you rewarm, he gets back to 37.4 at 15.43, and the Osborne waves are now completely gone. So keep up, keep on look out for Osborne waves. Obviously, if they're cold and you see it, you have your differential. But if they're not cold and you see it, then think hypercalcemia, we got it or early repolarization. All right. Yeah, great question. So uh, Melanie brings up uh, how on earth was he cold and inside his apartment or hotel room? Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But um, Danielle, did you guys have any initial ideas when you first got this about how he might have ended up so cold? Uh, we were pretty confused about why he was so cold. Um, it was in the 90s in Denver that week, so uh, not exposure to the elements. Um, we thought if he could have been under like an AC for a long time that was blasting cold air on him, maybe that could have happened. Um, but I think also on the differential for um, hypothermia is sepsis too. Perfect. Awesome. So keeping sepsis pretty high on the differential. All right. So, um, we're going to get some labs from the ER. So your first labs from the ER are shown on the screen. This is the shotgun that you know we all look at when we first get the patients. So kind of trying to simulate what it would be like to get the ED call. I took the I took the time to highlight the abnormalities in red. So what I want everyone to do is to take about a minute with the whiteboard that's near you, and I want everyone to try to identify as best they can every acid base abnormality that this person has. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask the people in the room to hold up their whiteboards to see who got closest. So Melody, I can't see that well. So I hear I see agma, uh, so anion gap, respiratory acidosis, and a metabolic alkalosis from Sam. Uh, a lot of people have two. Claire's got three on there. Davon. They went taught middle school at one point. Uh, I have actually, okay, so he's got a he's, he's got writing every day. Uh, and then Dan's got Dan's got some stuff and all that stuff too. Great. So this person, like most of you said, has um, three acid base abnormalities. And so he's got, based on the initial VVG, he has a respiratory acidosis because that PCO2 is elevated. And then the next thing you do is you move your BNP, and you can tell that your uh, anion gap is 25. And so I know we've kind of hammered this home throughout the year, but Anita's method of doing the anion gap, or the add back method, as the nephrologists call it, is where you take your anion gaps, so you take the 25, you subtract what's normal, which is 10 to 12 at our institution, and you get 13. You then take that number, and you add it back to the bicarb. So 13 plus 20 equals 33. And anything greater than about 26 is a metabolic alkalosis. And Anita is giving credit to uh, one of our nephrologists here, I think. And so what this person has is a respiratory acidosis. That's your primary care doctor. A primary care doctor, excuse me. That is even, that is even more impressive. <laughs> That's incredible. So a respiratory acidosis, an anion gap metabolic acidosis, and a metabolic alkalosis on top of that. 
So if you guys were betting, let's take a bet as to what all three of these things are from. So what do we think his respiratory acidosis is from? So Eliza says hypoventilation, perhaps from drugs. I think that's a great idea. All right. So two, what do we think his anion gap metabolic acidosis is from? All right, so Peter's guessing lactic acidosis, great guess. And then what do we think his metabolic alkalosis is from? <laughs> yeah, vomiting. So we're going to say GI losses or vomiting. Great. All right, so let's get some more labs here. So your lab's come back. He's got a lactate of 11.3, a trope of 0 0.27, which is elevated. He has a CK of 32,600. AI-hydroxybutyrate rate is normal, and his TSH is a little bit low at 0 0.41. You get some micro, which will come back, but we'll say you have it now. And one of two blood cultures are positive for coag negative staph, not lugdenensis, and P acnes, and his HCV antibody is positive. Kind of quick tangent here. Um, for any of our upper level residents in the room, why, why do we classify on the blood culture that it's not lugdenensis? Yeah. I say not. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like everything. Yeah, so Davon, Davon says that's not a contaminant. And so lugdenensis is one of the types of coagulase negative staph that behaves like staph aureus. And so if you ever see that on one of your blood cultures, please treat it overnight on cross cover. Um, don't defer that in the morning. And then P acne is also one of our uh, skin contaminants, so that they can be fined in, in acne. Um, and so both of those together suggest this is probably a contaminant. All right. All right. You get a UA that comes back. Uh, and now, if one of the interns in the room could interpret this UA form straight from Epic. A <laughs> lot. <laughs> <laughs> interpret it. Give a shot at the UA here. Mm, okay. uh, blood is large and only white blood cells. Small, so not Great. So Alana, Alana used like the, I think that's like type A reasoning where you see two things and you immediately infer like the most likely outcome. So she said this is probably rhabdo, which is exactly correct, which is what we'll spend the majority of this conference on. But um, what specifically are you looking at which led to the diagnosis of rhabdo? Um, comparing the blood to the RBC, so um, it won't have my blood and And so, sorry, I mean, no, that was perfect. Okay. Yeah, that was absolutely perfect. So what Alana was saying is you're actually picking up the myoglobin here. And so the UA is not smart enough to differentiate between hemoglobin and myoglobin. And so large blood with negative RBCs is essentially papanomonic or myoglobinuria, which is most commonly associated with rhabdo. And then you get a UDS back, which uh, is essentially a rainbow. Uh, the Driftwood Motel at a special. <laughs> I think it's always interesting. I think it's always interesting. What do you guys, one of our upper levels, could just give us some thoughts about the UDS here? Like what, what goes through your mind when you see a UDS which is this positive? Next party. <laughs> Keep in mind that you are in the given. If he's already been intubated, I think there's a decent chance he got opioids. So, Claire brings up a really good point. So, if he's already been intubated, did he get the opiates and the benzos before or after? In this case, I'll tell you that he, he actually got them after, and so it's hard to say. And then I thought the other really interesting thing here, which we sometimes forget about, is like what's negative? And so, having a negative blood alcohol level should always be something that, that makes us. A little bit on higher alert for our patients who clearly use other substances. Just there's a predictive value that they also have current alcohol is pretty high. But yeah, great takeaway, Claire. So making sure that you know what they got for their intubation or for sedation, and then, like Will said, making sure you're considering every other concomitant substance that you take. All right, so this uh, is kind of a similar picture to what Danielle and the team saw when they admitted. These are from a different patient at Denver Health. And so this is what myoglobinuria looks like. So that characteristic tea colored urine in the Foley. So you should put a Foley in these patients, and if this comes out, that's, that is the myoglobin, which uh, Alana is talking about. All right. So for nearly the remainder of this conference now, we are going to talk about rhabdo. 
because that's what this person is diagnosed with. But I wanted to start out by having us make one of our like hashtag problem lists for everything else that's going on with this guy. So we've got Rabdo here at the top. So this is going to kind of look like Danielle's initial H and P. But we've got Rabdo, but what else is wrong with this gentleman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Polysubstance use disorder, we have altered mental status, AKI, hypothermia, all of the acid base things we have. Alright, so agma, alkalosis, right? Got a woman. Got a woman. Intoxicated. <laughs> oh, he's got FC brain. Don't forget that. What about his LFTs? Transaminitis. Yeah. Liver. Liver injury. Troponemic. He's got a trope. Call cards. <laughs> so, he's got a trope. What else? He's in respiratory failure. <laughs> And I think Dan said this earlier, but he's got a leukocytosis, so we're also concerned he has sepsis. All right, so that is a lot of problems. And I think Danielle wrote an excellent initial H and P, which captured almost all of these in a much more succinct format than we just wrote it out here. Um, but I'm gonna let you guys prioritize. So what do you think are the three most likely things on this list that are gonna kill this guy? All right, so Alana says sepsis is on there. Renal failure. Okay, and respiratory failure, I like it. I'll give you guys a look. We're tying back the renal failure to Rabdo, so Rabdo will be on there as well. And then this is one that I think you guys might have forgotten because we serve some stuff in between, but he's also hyperkalemic right now. How high was it? He was 5.5, and then I'll refer to uh, Danielle here. So, Danielle, what happened after you guys got this person up to the MICU? Yeah, so our biggest concern when we saw him was the hyperkalemia. Um, we actually called renal before we even saw the patient. Um, but by the time he got up to the MICU, uh, that repeat EKG did show some more peak T waves than previously. Um, so we ended up shifting him. Um, he got pretty much everything for shifting. Um, we gave him insulin and glucose, um, continuous albuterol nebs, an amp of bicarb, um, and then we ended up giving him some Lasix as well. Awesome. So there's an order set to shift people, I think, in all of our hospitals, but we should still know how to do this in real life because this is something that comes up not infrequently. Um, so we know what Danielle gave, but for the people in the room, what dose of insulin do you want to give? Ten units regular. Ten units regular. And Matt, how do you want to give that? Uh, IV. Great IV. So don't don't give that IM. It'll take too long. So ten units regular IV, and then how much glucose or dextrose do you want to give? An AM. Great. So one AM for deep fifty. Perfect. How many albuterol nets do you want to give? <laughs> Right. No, one has any, no one has any idea, and that's the right answer. Um, albuterol meds of all the things on this list are probably the least efficacious. If you're giving just albuterol meds to someone with hyperkalemia, reevaluate what you're doing. <laughs> go, back, go back to the beginning. How do you guys want to give the bicarb? Okay, so one amp of bicarb, and then Davon, do you happen to know how many uh, milliequivalents ones of bicarb are in the one amp? Yeah, for fifty. And then how much Lasix do you guys want to give? H plus B U M. H plus B U M get him to fifty or sixty. Great, sounds good. Davon's quoting the House of God there, which is H <laughs> plus B U M, which is very evidence based. Uh, which is good. I think also you could get away with doing like 1.5 milligrams per kilogram or one mg per kg, but 60 actually ends up being pretty close to that. Perfect. So let's talk real quick here, actually no, real quick, let's talk a little bit here about rhabdo, because that is where his K is coming from. 
So what are the causes of rhabdo? So what I want you guys to do is now take 30 seconds to write down as many causes of rhabdo as you can on your whiteboard. And then we will come back and we'll figure it out. So, yeah. Yeah. It's not that, that's not. Right. So coming back to our groups here, so we're going to do because we are sitting in a weird U shape in this room, is we're going to go from person to person listing off causes of rhabdo until we get to what feels like an appropriate amount. Of so Dan, what's a cause of rhabdo? Uh, what is crush muscle injury? <laughs> awesome. So Dan invokes trauma or crush injury. Perfect. Next group, Eliza's group. Well, we said Perfect. Exercise, great. So strenuous exercise, so we'll just put CrossFit as a stand in here. Awesome. Great. And uh, so, um, great. Great. So, so all of the neuro stuff, great. So that actually sort of goes into the exercise thing. And so like seizures or stiffness, and then NMS goes under your hyperthermia. So hyperthermia or any sort of temperature problem can cause it as well. Okay. Uh, not moving. Not moving, great. So Davon invoking like a cellular hypoxia. So immobility. So if you sit on the ground for long enough, or in this case, if you lay on the Driftwood Motel for long enough, you don't perfuse your muscle and your muscle begins to break down because you're hypoxic. Claire. Oh, um, so I Stat is great. Drugs, so the one that we like, all of our clinic patients, they write it really large on the bottle, and so no one ever takes their statin. Uh, perfect statins can cause it. Steph. Black Mamba, so the VA is saying Black Mamba. Hell yeah. So illicit drugs, for those that don't know, or not, hopefully not used it. Actually, I don't think it's illicit. It's legal. That's how you get it. It's synthetic uh, it's cannabinoid. Synthetic. So it should be illicit. It's not illicit. It should be. Um, but any illicit drug, so cocaine and heroin, can cause, can cause rhabdo. Anything else? Electrolytes? Yeah, great. What electrolytes cause it? Hypo K and hypophos. Yeah. Maybe calcium, I can't remember. Yeah, so if you're low in K, phosphor, calcium, absolutely. And then one other big category we're missing here. So we had compartment syndrome, which I think is probably yeah, our trauma category. But myositis. Compartment syndrome, myositis. Myositis, we'll put in the uh, cellular hypoxia inflammation category. And then the very last one, you guys do gray is infection. So that flu, EBD, and CMV, and then just generally sepsis can cause it as well. So essentially what this list should take, your takeaway from this list should be that rhabdo can be caused by essentially everything we see in the hospital and a ton of presentations can all have rhabdo as either the main feature or as a kind of secondary uh, part. Okay, so these are the causes of rhabdo, but how do we actually diagnose rhabdo? With blood tests. With blood tests, great. <laughs> so what is our threshold or what do we, what do, we do to diagnose rhabdo? CK greater than 5,000. All right, so we've got one vote for CK greater than 5,000. What else? What other votes do we have? Myoglobinuria, perfect. AKI. AKI, AKI great. Clinical gestalt. Clinical gestalt, great. So you just like put your finger in the air and see if that turns into what it is. Great. So there's actually, this is a shocking thing I sort of realized when I was preparing for this, is there's actually no unified definition of rhabdo. Like no one's ever agreed on what it means. So some people think it's a CK greater than 1,000, and some people think it's greater than 5,000 for 72 hours. Some people say it's all these other complications, but no one really has any idea. And so the, the actual answer is it's clinical. So as Peter said, clinical just kind of said, uh, what's actually correct. But if the CK is up, that's one of the components of having rhabdo. So you have to have a CK, but then no one knows what to do with that. So, uh, Danielle, when you guys admitted this person, how confident were you that he had rhabdo? Uh, we were pretty confident just based on his labs. Um, one of the things I learned too was the constellation of labs that's pretty typical of rhabdo is everything that he had. Um, so the elevated K, um, elevated BUN and creatinine consistent with kidney injury that he had, um, Elevated AST in comparison to ALT is pretty um, consistent with rhabdo. And then the urine as well, um, the, uh, or no RBCs, but positive for blood. 
and he had all those things. The other thing too is also um, low calcium, which he had as well. It's pretty typical because uh, calcium actually deposits inside the necrosing muscle cells and it complexes with phosphate as the muscles dying and phosphates released. Awesome. That is a really good explanation. And so um, one of the really interesting things about what Daniel and about the calcium is, um, what do we have to do to treat someone who's hyperkalemic? Stimulus yeah, perfect. So we have to give them calcium. So if someone is in rapid, the only time it's ever recommended to replete their calcium is if they're high, like dangerously hyperkalemic. Um, for the same reasons that we don't replete the calcium or the K, uh, the FOS in ESRD patients. So there's something like called the calcium FOS product. And if that product is high enough, you can get extra deposition in muscles. So the exact same process that Danielle was talking about, unless they are dangerously hyper, uh, hyperkalemic, do not give these people calcium. And then the other one of these, uh, which is up, which Danielle, I think might have mentioned, is the FOS. So FOS K. And then where do both of these things come from? Inside the center cell. Yeah. So if your cell ruptures, those are the things that are released into the blood, along with the AST. And then interestingly enough, the BU and the creatinine ratio typically tends to be a little bit lower than you see in some other like pure uh, volume depletion states, because your creatinine comes from muscle, and so your creatinine will probably be it probably won't actually be a 20 to 1 ratio or something like that. It'll be lower than that. It'll still be high, but not necessarily that high. All right. And then, Danielle, once this person came up to the MICU, um, what did you guys do to risk stratify him in terms of the rapido? Yeah, so his CK was really high. It was in the 30,000 range. Um, and just kind of reading and learning about rapido, anything above 5,000, you're typically worried about kidney injury. Um, so our main thing for him uh, with talking with renal too was to get him fluids. Um, so we actually started him on, uh, he, got a, he got a lot of fluids in the ED, but we started him on maintenance fluids as well when he came up. Um, I guess kind of the goal to prevent kidney injury by flushing out the myoglobin as best we could. Great. And Danielle, um, what did you learn about myoglobin and the kidney? Uh, while you were treating this guy. Yeah, so it can actually cause a renal injury in a couple of different ways. Um, it can cause casts in the tubules. Um, it can also cause direct epithelial injury um, in the tubules. And then it can uh, actually cause vasoconstriction as well, leading to decreased perfusion to the kidneys, which I did not know. Great. Yeah, so I think when I was when I was a med student, I was like, oh, it's the CK, it's the CK, it's not. CK is completely meaningless. So what Danielle is saying is it's the myoglobin, which is actually causing these people injured. So it's a myoglobin-induced AKI, and some nephrologists will then say it's a heme pigment-induced AKI. So that is the actual thing that's causing the uh, renal injury. And then Danielle, how did you guys make a decision about how much fluid to give this person? Um, we talked to renal, and they guided that, but... Uh, basically, they gave us a goal of you wanted to keep the urine output around 200 cc's an hour. Um, so we, I think you just typically start at 100 to 200 cc's an hour of maintenance fluids um, and titrate it from there based on the urine output. Great. And so this is one of those ones that if you're signing this out to a person who cross cover in the MICU, it's actually incredibly important for them to go back and check to see what the urine output is actually doing. Um, because like we'll talk about in a second, if the urine output drops off, something has to change. And then Danielle, what type of fluid, just so we're being extremely specific here, what type of fluid did you give this person? We gave normal saline uh, just because he was hyperkalemic. Um, we didn't want to give him LR. Great. So Danielle and the team gave NS versus LR because he was a little bit hyperkalemic and there is a concern with LR that you can worsen someone's hyperkalemia. It's probably theoretical, um, but it's a good thing to consider. And then uh, NS is certainly not wrong in this instance. The person needs fluid. But what is the one problem with NS? Um, what does NS do to our kidneys in large amounts? Yeah, so in large amounts, it causes renal injury. Does anyone know like what the reason for that renal injury is? The hyperchloremic acidosis. Yeah, so it causes a magma due to hypochloremia. And so um, 
one of the takeaways from this session should be there's absolutely no data to guide anything we do in Rabdo. It's sort of just a see what happens approach. There's no RCTs. But we know that NS causes a magma or a little bit of renal injury through an acidosis. And one of the really interesting things that I learned about myoglobin is that it precipitates more if there's more acidosis. So if your urine is acidotic, the myoglobin may precipitate more with a TAM or with a TAM force protein. And so there's some, there's some belief that giving these people LR or a, a balanced fluid may be more beneficial, but then again, they've done like small studies and there's been no difference. So just something to consider. Um, NS versus LR, sort of an ongoing debate, but neither is wrong in this case. Okay, the next thing is, I want to talk about this. Danielle did this when the person came in. There's something called the McMahon score for Rabda. So I pulled it up here on the screen. Danielle, can you tell us a little bit about the McMahon score? I actually did not do this score when I came in. <laughs> <Sorry. All right. laughs> That's all right. Um, so the McMahon score, I, I think I, I thought I had talked about it. I might not know. Um, so the McMahon score is something that was developed in 2013. It was a JAMA article out of Brigham and Women's. Essentially what they looked at was, can we predict who with rhabdo ends up on CRRT or HD and who ends up with an AKI or who dies? And so what you do is you put in there a number of components in here. And so this guy is less than 50, so zero points. He's a male. His creatinine was in the threes. His calcium was less than 7.5. His CDK was not that high. He was not due to exercise status or myositis, and his phosphate was definitely up, but his bicarb was low, not low. So he gets a score of 11 points for his McMahon score. And what the McMahon score tells us is that it's less than six, or it's pretty good negative predictive value that you're a low risk case of rhabdo. So less than six, you can probably have these people on the floor. You may not even necessarily need to give them large volume fluids. You just need to watch them. Greater than six, you're starting to get in trouble. And then greater than 10, you have about a 52% chance of death or AKI requiring RRT during their study. And so this is the only score essentially that we have to list stratify someone with rhabdo. Um, and I would recommend that if you guys are admitting someone with rhabdo, just include it in your note. Um, I think the ED does this occasionally for people in terms of like destination uh, and sort of what they need to do. So this guy has a score of 11, so he's already in a bad spot. He's in the MICU. And then I'm going to go back to Danielle here to tell us sort of what happened next in his care. So Danielle signed this person out to one of her cross-cover co-interns, and the case continues. Yeah, so he remained pretty persistently hyperkalemic overnight, um, despite us giving the shifting agents. Uh, his potassium was still in the fives and sixes. Um, so he ended up having to get started on CRRT overnight. Excellent. So he gets CRT and, um, just to be, just so we're absolutely clear, the, the purpose of the CRT is the hyper K. So CRT can't remove myoglobin. And so when we talk about giving people CRT um, for rhabdo, it's purely to make sure they don't die from hyperkalemia. There's absolutely nothing we can do at that point to change the trajectory of their, of their actual kidney injury from the myoglobin. And so I think like when I was in med school, we talked about like the AEIOU, right, for indications to start HD. And so even more recently, there was a study that came out last year called the START AKI trial, which me and Corey have talked about too much in our office. So essentially, the start AKI trial looked at if you put people on HD immediately if they're critically ill versus you delay it to a certain indication, who does better? And what do you guys think happened uh, when you compared immediate HD versus delayed HD? I don't think it's, I think people end up getting dialysis for Joe. I think there's no question. Yeah. So there's, this study has been replicated like four or five times in the ICU, but essentially there's no difference in mortality. The one really interesting thing from the study though is that there were more people at 90 days on HD than the accelerated group. So essentially, if you put people on HD, there was like 10% were on HD at 90 days versus 6% of people who got started when they met like a true indication. And so true indications in this study were a K greater than six, so like this guy had, a pH less than 7.2, a bicarb less than 12, it was a P to F less than 200 plus volume overload, or this kind of nebulous AKI greater than 72 hours. And so just like Danielle was saying, this guy actually met one of these criteria. His urine output dropped off 
And this is one you should absolutely talk to renal because now we sort of know that there's no indication we're putting a marker in these people before they actually need it. Danielle, any additional thoughts or teaching points about the decision to start CRT in this guy? Yeah, we actually had discussed too if um, there's any indication for prophylactically starting dialysis in these rhabdo patients. And like you said, there's not, um, it hasn't been shown effective at all to remove the myoglobin before it causes injury. Um, yeah, so for him, it was really the hyperkalemia that we did that for. Um, and he actually had good urine output for that first night and then it dropped off the next day, but that would have been another issue for him too was the volume overload. So just a really critical reminder that if you're treating someone with rhabdo and their urine output drops off and you don't change their fluid, you will drown them in salt water or LR and just make their hospital stay longer. So really nice work by Danielle and the big UT. Does anyone have any questions about this guy's rhabdo management? Yeah, so Melanie asked, would you consider keeping this guy cooler than normal to prevent his K from going up so fast? Danielle, did you guys talk about that at all? We did not, and that's one of the things kind of reflecting back on this um, might have contributed to why his potassium stayed elevated when we were trying to shift him. Um, cause when you rewarm people that can also shift potassium out of the cells, but, um, he actually became, um, normal thermic pretty quickly with a bear hugger. And then he was, um, febrile after that. Great. So I actually hadn't been talking about this, but it's super important changes. So a few things happen when we are cold and we become warmer. And so Melanie mentioned one of them. So our electrolytes go a lot of whack. And one of those is that our K goes up. So being cold makes you hypo K lenient unless you start to have rhabdo and your muscles break down. But what else happens when we are cold? I don't know if I can explain why that's super, but like when you cool people, hypo or hyper. Yeah, so hyperglycemia. So essentially, your insulin doesn't work as well if you're cold, right? We really get a little constricted, so we can start in one when we get a watch out for shock and we start thinking about the Great. So, as you rewarm people and blood starts to go to your extremities where it wasn't previously, you're essentially removing fluid from the core. Um, great. The other thing that happens is people uh, lose the ability to coagulate, so their coagulopathy gets worse. So, essentially, uh, when you're colder, you bleed more. And then the very last one is when you're colder, you're at a higher infection risk. And so essentially any, any cell in your body for the most part does not work better than it's cold. And so warming people is beneficial, but if you warm them too fast, you can get hyperkalemic, hypotensive, um, and perhaps hypoglycemic. So talking a little bit about this guy's infection risk here. So Danielle mentioned at the very beginning, and Melanie mentioned this too, that everyone was concerned he was septic because of his uh, initial hypothermia. So here was his initial chest x-ray in the ED. And we've got about a couple minutes left, but there's one of our upper levels going to give us the most focused read of this chest x ray anyone's ever heard. Schmutz on the right. Schmutz on the right. Great. <laughs> so, uh, Danielle, so you got CT, and this is going to be a quick run through the CT here. What is the abnormality in the CP or abnormalities? Not so. Fusion, <laughs> you know. small, lateral more on the right. This dude probably aspirated. So. Consolidation. Perfect. So consolidation is great. So maybe aspirated. So what you guys are looking at here was dense consolidation with air bronchograms. And so those things right there are air bronchograms on cross section, going through a densely consolidated lung. He's got ground glass opacities as well, which is this area right here. So if that's your densely consolidated stuff, a really good reminder that that's what ground glass looks like. And then the subtle finding is that he also has tree and bud nodularity. And so tree and bud is one of those things that always really confused me when I was um, still less confused me. But essentially a tree and bud, if you imagine your alveoli out here, 
That is what the tree and bud looks like. And so you see that towards the periphery of the lung is the tree and bud nodule. And the differential for tree and bud nodularity is essentially most common is infection and aspiration. And so this guy, in this particular case, he was cold, he felt unwell before he came in, so maybe he was infected. He also might have aspirated. All right, Danielle, so go ahead and tell us um, for the last part here how this case ended. Um, so he ended up self extubating actually, um, but his mental status uh, did improve a little bit um, and he was a lot less agitated once he was extubated. Um, he is still on dialysis, he's now um, on hemodialysis. Um, and then I saw that he has actually developed a lot of complications from being in the hospital, unfortunately. He has C. diff um, and he got a lower extremity DVT as well. Um, and it's kind of unclear what his renal function will be in the future, but um, he still has kind of a long road ahead of him. Great. So I think, a I mean, I think this is a really excellent case because it highlights something we see a lot. We see a lot of CKs that are elevated, but there's a full spectrum of rhabdo. And it points out that people who have rhabdo, we can try our best to support them, but this is the thing we worry about is that someone's going to end up without renal recovery on CRT or HD for an extended period of time. And so just to be really cognizant, if you see an elevated CK, make sure you're also considering that the level is worse, that might mean the man score is high, consider so treating them with sort of aggressive IV fluid. Uh, Danielle, what are your takeaways from this case? Um, kind of like what we talked about before, just that typical lab pattern that you look for um, with rhabdo. And then um, management of treatment. I think hyperkalemia is the thing we're worried about the most for him. Um, and then indications for dialysis in these patients aren't any different than anyone else, the AEIOU. Um, another thing I learned was that the hypocalcemia um, is pretty typical and you don't want to treat that. Um, because you can get, I think, hypercalcemia later on in the course. Um, and then IV fluids are just super important in the beginning, trying to preserve renal function. Great. A huge thank you to Danielle for presenting this case. Uh, the team did an awesome job with the guy who had way more going on than can be presented here. So we really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone else who, for coming to conference. Have a great day.